Thank you, Cindy. It's so great to see all of you here. So um, I belong to a book club uh, loosely. I haven't been there for a few months. But uh, once a month we meet, and uh, the book that we read in Ju this past June was Tattoos on the Heart. And I think we, were, we read it because we were inspired that Bellarmine was having their students read it. And I was so moved by it that uh, when I, uh, this summer I went down to California, drove down to California, and I went to see a, a brother of mine and some friends in Bakersfield, and I thought, you know, I really want to go. I felt like I was on a pilgrimage. I wanted to go to Dolores Mission. So I left at 4.30 in the morning, <laughs> drove to Dolores Mission, using my phone to find it, um, got there just after seven, um, there, it was a homeless shelter for, uh, for some men, and there was a homeless shelter for some women a few blocks away, and I met Father Ted, the pastor there, and um, he t t shared some of what their ministries are, which was great, and then I thought, well, I want to I keep going, and I want to go to Homeboy, Homeboy Industries. So I went there, um, I asked if I could meet uh, uh, Father Greg, and uh, things were just slowly moving. It was still early in the morning. And um, so they, I, my name was on a list, like seven or eight. And I sat down, and of course, you know, people were spread out in the lobby. And the lobby isn't that large. And then eventually I saw Father Greg come in with a few people. And then uh, the most amazing thing happened. They have every morning, I think it's maybe around nine o'clock, they have um, a thought for the day and some announcements and so on. So. I felt very honored to, to watch all this happen. And, um, you know, Father Greg led it and then invited people from the different services that they provide to give updates. And after each, uh, each update, people would clap. Um, there were a lot of birthday um, singing for different people, and they would clap. And um, Father Greg talked about uh, the Delta variant that had come out and was urging people, especially with children, to get vaccinated. And then a, a, a young man shared the thought for the day. And he went up to the microphone and he said, you know, it's, it's perspectives. And he had a great analogy. He said, um, if you imagine that uh, you're driving Los Angeles along a hill, a hillside, and a cliff over the edge, and they decide to put up a guardrail um, some people might think, some perspectives might be, you know, you kind of ruined the view. We don't really need that there. People can drive safe on their own. They don't, they don't need a guardrail. And then other people would see that as, you know, safety. And then he said, you know, the uh, reflectors on a guardrail, they're asking us to slow down and to take care of each other. And he said, that's what we're trying to do here. And it was beautiful. And I was just so moved. And then another person led prayer. So I was just so impressed with how many people are involved with Homeboy Industries, just my little glimpse of it. And then I was able to meet Father Greg. But that took a number of hours before I got to see him because there are so many people that want to see him, which I can understand. And he would you know, come out in the hallway from his office and he would hug people. And um, there was a, a couple that I, I remember that he uh, invited to come in. He met with them for a little bit. And then he walked them outside. And this is right before I was going to meet him. And he did a blessing for them out on the sidewalk, which I thought was so beautiful. And then he told me, he said, you know, I, I called them in before you because uh, I just know they don't do well around people. So I just, I, you know, I was just very moved. And so just some things about Father Greg. Um, uh, Father Greg entered the Jesuits. Uh, Society of Jesus in 1972, was ordained a priest in 1984, taught at Loyola High School in Los Angeles, a chaplain at Islas Marias, a penal colony in Mexico and Folsom Prison, um, chaplain there, uh, served with Christian communities in Cochabamba, Bolivia, I think I butchered it, sorry. Uh, 1986, appointed pastor at Dolores Mission Church, and then in 1988 began Homeboy Industries, the largest gang intervention rehab and reentry program in the world. Uh, wrote Tattoos on the Heart in 2010, Barking to the Choir in 2017, and most recently The Whole Language and uh, The Power of Extravagant Tenderness. And if you ever get a chance, the audios which he reads are amazing. And um, he's received several awards and honors. And um, before Father Greg speaks, Raquan and Jose will speak. 
So let's give them a great welcome. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Raquan Johnson. I'm coming from Los Angeles. I work at Homeboy Industries as an IT support specialist. Um, so I'm just going to go through a brief walkthrough of my life. Um, as a child, I, I grew up with a single mom, um, working two jobs, you know, struggling to maintain, you know. So I would come home occasionally to uh, eviction notices on the door, you know, because we couldn't pay rent or something. So I kind of... I kind of didn't want to ask for too much, but she always somehow made a way to, to make Christmas happen or birthdays happen, you know, but um, I found myself trying to find ways to make money on my own. And um, I grew up with my uncles and my cousins, which were like, you know, um, gang members, you know, and they, were, and they were always in this mentality of, if you're a, a man, you gotta be tough or strong and you gotta know how to fight and defend yourself. And this is, so I, I kind of grew up like with a little hopeless feeling and, and, and kind of confused of, of, of what a real man is because um, my father wasn't around to show me what that, what that was. So um, I ended up following in the footsteps of you know, my cousins and my uncles, which were gang members. And I ended up becoming one myself and following down that, that pipe, that, that tunnel of, of hopelessness and and, and nothing coming in the future. And um, um, I, I went through that phase for a while, you know, through my early teens onto my adult years. And um, I ended up getting incarcerated, I think about at 19. 19, I caught my first case. Um, I, wasn't, I didn't do too much time right there at that time. Um, I ended up bailing out. So once I bailed out, um, well, fresh out of high school, just to go back a little bit, I moved out of my mom's house and I, I wanted to see life on my own because um, what my mom did when she had me, she ventured out on her own as an early, early mom too. So I, I, I left home, you know, I, um, and I wanted to, to, to venture out. So once I got incarcerated and I left, I got out of jail, I didn't have a place to go. Um, I, was, I was sleeping in the back of a, of a Nissan Frontier, like a 99, 2000 Nissan, Nissan Frontier, because I had no home. Um, I couldn't go home to my mom because she was, she was far, far away. And, um, you know, I struggled a bit. I struggled with homelessness. Um, I tried to work, but they, they had this thing called Caltrans, so I had to do, um, it's, um, it's like, um, con it's not construction, it's kind of like landscaping work, but it's eight hours a day, so it was free work, but I couldn't, obviously I couldn't get a job on top of that and maintain both of those at the same time. So I would work for a temp agency, you know, um, short term, and then certain days I would work, certain days, you know, I would, I would do that, and then, um, I would sleep in the back of that frontier, and you know, when I had a little bit of money here, I would, you know, rent a motel or something so I could get some rest and shower or whatever. You know, it was it was a struggle, you know, my whole life, um, just trying to figure out how how can I make it, how can I, you know, go against the margins and and be able to succeed because all I know was was suffering and pain. And um, so after that, you know, um, I I kind of got on my my feet a little bit. I had a little steady job. I was living in a motel that rented monthly, and um, you know I kind of cut ties with a lot of people, and I tried to do things on my own, but it was hard because I was lonely and I didn't, I didn't know how to be on my own. I didn't know how to, you know, just cope with with everything that I've been through in life. So when I got lonely, I didn't have friends that were like regular people that I could, you know, go you know, explore downtown and do regular people things. All my friends were gang members and all my friends, you know, knew the same things as me. So what happened was I ended up, you know, going back. I ended up going back and just, you know, back into the lifestyle and it started becoming like a, from, went from a weekend thing, like when I had my days off to, um, I ended up losing my job. And I lost my job because I broke my hand and then I, I ended up back over there in that same situation, that same struggle, not having a place, not having a job you know, living in a, a, like a, pretty much like an abandoned spot almost with no hot water, you know, cold showers and all that. So it's like, I was just like, man, here I am again, back in the struggle, back in the suffering, you know, like when is, when is, when am I going to have a chance? So um, I, I went through that for a minute and um, ended up getting incarcerated again. And this time, you know, I was facing some time, but, um, you know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of, at that point, was, was an eye-opener for me because, like, my friends, you know, they turned against me at that point. 
and um, I felt like I didn't have anybody at that point. I felt like everything that I ever lived was a lie, everything that I ever was taught as a kid, you know, by my uncles, by my family members, everything that was instilled in me, I felt like it was, it was all fabricated. I felt like, you know, this is not me. I, I can do better for myself. I deserve better for myself. Like, I should focus on being happy, you know? I always wanted to be happy, but it seemed like every time I would have happiness, something would happen, and then I'll be back in, in pain and suffering. So I was like, you know what? If I make it out, I'm gonna do good for myself. I'm gonna, you know, change my life. I'm gonna try to be successful, try to be happy, try to seek that happiness wherever it may be, whatever it may be. And, um, you know, I was granted that, that, that wish, that, that prayer, and um, I was set free. Um, so as I was set free, once again, I got out with nowhere to go, no one to turn to, and, um, but I was on parole, so I ended up getting into this parole program in Skid Row, it's on 6th and San Pedro at the Wine Guard. Um, if any of you have been to LA and know Skid Row, it's, it's not a place where you wanna be. You know, there's homeless people everywhere, tents everywhere, it's, it's bad. But that's the only place I had to stay because they, they let me have a room for free. It was like, like a single. So I was staying there and I was like, you know what? I need to work. Because I've always was a hard worker. I, I always try to take care of myself. You know, that's one thing my mom did teach me. You know, she was always there trying to show me the way. And I, I, took, I took that after her, you know, being a hard worker, trying to provide for myself. So I'm like, I need to get a job. Um, but my record, it was kind of hard for me to find a job because I had felonies, you know. I tried to, you know, do the whole Uber, Lyft thing, got denied for that. I tried to apply to, like, Walmart and places. Like, it just, it just wasn't working out. Nobody wanted to hire me or give me a chance because of my record. It, it didn't show who I was inside. It just showed, you know, my past and the things that I've been through. So um, one day, one of my homies, I'm talking to one of my homies, and he's like, hey, I'm going to go get tattoo removed by Humble Industries. I'm like, what? That's where I can get a job. So I'm like, oh, man, that's great. So I go there, right? I'm waiting. I'm in the lobby. Um, I wait for about a, a minute, you know? <laughs> it's packed there. Everybody goes there. So um, I get a little anxious, and, and like I step out, and I, I hop on the train, the gold line, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a job at a temp, temp agency, like, hey, you know, what's up? And somebody tells me to go back. So I go back, and I sit there, and I wait, and they finally call me, and I meet Pops, which is Gee, this man right here, and um, he brought me in the office, you know, and, and it was something about him that was so warm, welcoming, and loving. Like, honestly, I, I can't describe the feeling. Like, it, he, he treated me like he's known me his, own li his whole life since I was a kid, you know. He, like, he, it was, it was, it was I, I can't describe the feeling. And, um, you know, I pretty much told him, look, hey, I just got out, you know. Um, I'm trying to get a job. I want to, you know, better my, my life and my future. And he hired me right there on the spot. And, um. From there, I started, you know, with the training program, and um, I was like, man, every day coming in, you know, I would see, you know, the environment there. It's like, we're all, we're all previously incarcerated, you know, we've all former gang involved and all of that, but it's like, there it's not that feeling. It's a feeling of like, we're all together, we're all one, we're all family. Like, we all look out for each other, we open the door for each other, we say, good morning, how are you doing? Like, we check on each other, it's, it's crazy. So I'm like, wow, like, this is, this is home. You know, this is, this is a place where, you know, opportunities can happen. So, you know, I'm, I'm taking these classes to work on myself, like self-healing, working on anger management, um, past traumas, every, every, all types of different classes are available there. So I'm, I'm just in there sitting in class, learning, working on myself, trying to build and grow as a person. And um, so one day there's this class called Pathways to College where um, this, this lady, her name is Brittany, and she, she pretty much gives you, like, tours in, of colleges and you sit there in that class for, and talk about what do you want to do with your life. And so I ended up mentioning um, IT because that's what my mom does now, you know. So I'm like, yeah, IT sounds about good. And um, so she actually introduces me to the, the head IT there at the time, Andrew. He's still head IT now. And um, he, he takes me under his wing and, and he, he literally like teaches me everything he knows. And I became his little protege and it's like I never expected that. I never expected that for my life. I never expected to have a career, a future like that. I, I never seen that for myself. I always seen, you know what, I'm just gonna suffer my whole life. Nothing's ever gonna good come out of what I'm going through. And um, you know, homeboys is a place where you can turn something that you want or something that you have faith in into a fact. You know, something that's possible, reachable, obtainable. You know, I mean, there's so many programs, so many opportunities there. It's like you just have to want it, and I wanted it so. I achieved it, and so now, you know, I am the IT guy there. Now I, I'm, you know, one of the, the main people there. And um, 
if it wasn't for homeboys, I wouldn't have a career. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here talking to you people right now. I'd probably be incarcerated, to be honest with you. Like, homeboys gave me a chance. They, they, they say, you know what? We don't care about what your past is. We're going to give you an opportunity to show who you are now. And with that opportunity, I was able to change my life. You know, I have two beautiful daughters, and um, they're my world, and I'm able to provide for them. Because of homeboys, I'm able to do so much. I'm in school right now, getting a CompTIA A plus certificate, project management certificates. Like, the list goes on. Like, I could talk all day about homeboy issues, but I'm just saying, like, you know, from coming from a past where nothing looked for certain, you know, like fears of being evicted, not having a home, fear, and going through homelessness and all that, too, actually having my own apartment, having my own car, having a career, going to school. Like, it, it's, it's life-changing, and if it wasn't for Homeboy Industries, honestly, I wouldn't have anything. You know, I'd probably still be struggling, or like I said, incarcerated, and, you know, them taking that chance on me really, really saved my life, and that's it. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Diaz. I also work for Homeboys Industry. I'm also an IT support specialist. And I'm, like, like Raquan said, I'm here to talk about myself a little bit, too. Um, I come from a broken down family where uh, my dad used to be really aggressive, real violent. You know, uh, physical abuse happened every day. Um, how can I say this? And uh, since I could remember, like, I would I stand up for my mom, you know? I would, never let her, I would never let her get beaten. And that would, that would take the results of me getting beaten, me getting pissed up, me getting thrown out the house, you know, since like four years old. And um, I think it was like around eight or nine years old, because I come from a third generation of gang banging. So my grandfather gang bang, my dad gang bang, I gang bang. And um, how can I say this? Um, yeah, it was, it was I, I, I always got taught I would never mount my mom to nothing, you know? I was like, I was, this was my life. I never knew what was beside the, behind that wall, you know? And, um, and yeah, so since an early age, I never really had a childhood. You know, I never had the luxury of playing with toys or even know how to play hide go seek or anything like that, you know? My life was just selling drugs and doing what gang banging do, you know? And um, my, I started my journey in, in being incarcerated since I was 10 years old. And uh, I remember I did about a year before I got out and when I got out, the first thing that my dad told me was like, oh, Joe is for men, you know? And since you're a man now, um, you can't live in this house unless you bring money to the house. You know, if you can bring no money in the house, the door is right there, you know? So I didn't know how to take that. Um, so he beat me up, you know, he beat me up. He really like dragged me to the door. I remember my mom was trying to stop it. She got beat down too. And eventually I ended up getting thrown out. I lived in the street for like maybe from 11 to 13 until I got incarcerated again. And um, after that, I did maybe like six months in juvenile hall, went to camp, went to YA with this youth authority prison, and I finally got out again. And um, through, all those, through all that, being back in the streets, because I didn't know what, to, what else to do with besides what he taught me, um, yes, you know, back again, selling, being in the streets. Um, I ended up getting shot four times, you know, um, I got sent to a coma, and like, like I said, I, I never knew I was going to be a mountain or nothing, you know? I didn't have no hope, I didn't have nothing, so the only thing that, that showed me false hope was the gang. So, you know, so I will always go back to that. No matter what happened, I will always go back to that. And um, like, like Raquan said, like, I didn't have no home. You know, I was sleeping park benches since I was a kid. I will find the darkest, creepiest alley just because I know nobody would go in there. You know, there was this one, like, uh, a nasty couch would be right in the middle of the alley, and that's where I would sleep at most of the times. You know, and for some reason, I felt safe, just because I know nobody would go in there. You know, just not the person, not the place where anybody just walk, and you know, and walk through. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, I did a lot of, a lot of my time. Um, I spent more than half of my time in prison, and in jail, prison, and stuff like that, and in the streets. And uh, when, I, when I finally did my, the longest term I did was seven years. When I finally did seven years and I got out, I, I told myself, like, this is, not I want, this is not what I want. You know, this is not, a, like, I always thought I always, I always knew this was not for me, you know? Like, I'm here for a reason. If I've been shot four times, sent to a coma, been beat down since I was four years old, and I'm still here, I'm here for a reason. 
you know, and um, for the grace of God, I met, I met this girl, you know, who, got, who gave me my two boys that I got now, but still, it, there was like, like, I didn't know, I didn't know, not, I didn't know how to do nothing. My dad never showed me how to be a man, how to work or nothing. All he did was, was what Guy and Banger does. And um, so, yeah, so it came to the time that uh, um, I got, I got picked up another case and, and you know, uh, I lost my kids, you know, so um, I'm thank, thankful I'm getting them back for, because of Homeboys Industries and because of Raquan. He, he brought me to Homeboys, you know, and he like, hey, this is the place where you want to be. You know, if you really think you really want this, you really want to change your life, this is the place to be, you know. And, um, and, as, and, and it is, you know, because like homeboys show me, because of homeboys industry, show me how to be a better man and how to be a better dad for my kids. Because now as, as before I went to homeboys, my son would tell me, hey, daddy, let's play hide and go seek. I'm like, what is hide and go seek? Like, who do I got to hide and why do I got to go seek? You know, like, it didn't, it didn't make no sense to me, like, you know. <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm like, okay, so, but now I got the concept, you know, like, I never really had a childhood. So, having my, my two boys gave me the childhood I never had, you know, so, um, and like, uh, how can I tell you? Yeah, so, we keep, I went back to homeboys, and I, I'm working on myself, too, all the, through all the traumatic experiences. I went to therapy, you know, I went to anger management, um, domestic violent classes, just to be a better man and a better husband to my, to my wife. You know, I went to parenting classes to be a better father to my kids because I never, I never had that father figure, except for Father Greg, which is I call him Pops, just because he, he gave me the unconditional love that nobody did. You know, when, when I talk to him, when he seen me, um, he don't see me no different from anybody else. You know, and that's, I think that's what brought the whole back, back into my heart to be a better man. You know, and as far as, uh, um, I never thought I would have a career. I never thought I would, I would go out and, like, and be this person that I am now. I always thought I was never going to amount to nothing. I was going to spend my life in prison or, or, or dead, you know. And thanks, for home, uh, thanks to Homeboys Industries, it changed my way of thinking, you know. I got, a, like I said, I got a career now. I became a better man to my kids, to my wife. I became a person overall, you know. It changed me completely, the way I think, the way I think about people. Like, you know, like I always, I, I never really, I never was really a, a real religious type of man. Until now, you know, because I always said, like, if there was a God, he has never seen life through my eyes. But till now, you know, I guess he gives um, the best of his soldiers, you know, the hardest life, just because we know we're going to come back on top. You know, so um, I really don't know what else to say. I'm just, I just want to say that I'm really grateful to Homeboys Industries and to Father Gray for giving me another opportunity in life. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your hospitality, and uh, we've had a good time. We're, we're in uh, Seattle, and so uh, you know we've eaten well, and the weather is amazing. And thanks to my friends uh, Bill and Chris, they, uh, these guys were able to see, uh, you know, whatever the needle thing and the <laughs> and a bunch of other things. Uh, so uh, it's an honor, the privilege of my life uh, to know these two gentlemen and thousands like them. The, the day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I'm closer to God than Raquan and Jose. Um, traffic is really intense from uh, Seattle to Tacoma, so we had, we had, a, we had a wonderful conversation about uh, life coming here. So I. I will uh, value that time that we spent with each other. Um, you know, the homies are always teaching me things. I remember there was a, a homie named Luis Perez who kind of ran a homeboy for a while, and he, uh, you know, for almost 10 years, shot caller from his gang and a heroin addict and was in prison a lot. and. I'd send him to go give talks sometimes because he liked doing it, and, and he, was, he was getting to be quite good at it. And, and uh, we went out to dinner once, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. And, <laughs> and he says, you know, you got to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I 
And I said, yeah, no shit. That's, uh, that is some good advice. Um, thank you for mentioning my, my newest book, uh, The Whole Language. I, you know, I, I was uh, f uh, flying to Washington, D.C. with two homies to speak at uh, the Ignatian Solidarity uh, uh, thing that they have there, and uh, I was walking back to my seat from the restroom, and uh, there was somebody on the aisle, and they had the tray table down, and a book was opened. And the cover of my new book is kind of this uh, d turquoise distinctive, you know, and I, and I go, oh my God, some, they're reading my book. And so I'm trying to play it off and I'm walking by and I want to see who it is and <laughs> knocked out, completely drooling. So just doing my part for, to help sleeplessness in Seattle. Um, you know, walking in here, people were saying, you know, that, oh, I'd heard you here, and, and I heard you there, and Chicago, and at LMU, and, and it happens. You know, I, I remember I was speaking to a, a bunch of uh, this huge foster grandparent gathering in Orange County. I had spoken the summer before. I don't know why they, they invited me two summers in a row, you know, but there you have it. And uh, so I went the second summer to speak, and, and afterwards, a, a grandmother came up to me. She had, I think she liked the talk. She had big tears in her eyes, and she grabbed both my hands, and she said, I heard you last year. <laughs> it never gets better. <laughs> so uh, kind of hoping she misspoke there, but uh, <laughs> anyway, that's all the self-defecating I have for, uh, for, for the evening. So, you know, it, this, the, the juxtaposition is this Jesuit, uh, justice summit time where, where we try to imagine the world looking differently than it currently looks. And, and so you have the, the sort of an undergirding vision of wanting it to be aligned uh, with God's dream come true, or as Jesus says, that you may be one. And so we want to imagine a circle of compassion, and then we want to imagine nobody standing outside that circle. We want to choose to uh, dismantle the barriers that exclude. You know, uh, the, the Zen uh, masters would say, there's no such thing as an enlightened person, only enlightened action. So we want to not just imagine a world that looks differently, we want to roll up our sleeves. We don't want to just point things out, we want to point the way. We want to choose to be a light that people can see by. So we inch our way out to the margins uh, because that's the only way they'll ever get erased. And so we stand with a particularity, with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, and we stand with those whose dignity has been denied, and we stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. And every once in a while, we, whoa, what a, a privilege to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out. We get to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And all the while we try to create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it, knowing that no kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice, no kinship, no equality, no matter how singularly focused we may well be on those worthy goals, they actually can't happen unless uh, there's some underlying sense of connection. Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? 
And I suspect if kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We would be celebrating it. And so we go to the margins and we brace ourselves because uh, the world will accuse you of wasting your time there. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, of, of this place of which you speak, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And you go to the margins and other voices get heard. Well, the truth of the matter is none of that makes any damn sense at all if it weren't for our, our notion of God that kind of is underneath it, that holds it. There's nothing more consequential in our lives than our notion of God. It's just we're, we're determined by it. Uh, Richard Rohr says, of course, we're all created in the image and likeness of God, but our image of God creates us, which I think is, of course, true. So if, you're, if your image of God is puny and exacting and, and demanding and judgmental and wrathful and one false move, God, then you will be that in the world. You won't have any choice in the matter, really. But if your God is spacious and, and loves us without measure and without regret and is tender and is expansive, then you will be that way too. Meister Eckhart, a, a theologian and mystic who lived a long time ago, uh, used to say, it is a lie, any talk of God that doesn't comfort you. Now, we want to believe that's true, but there's a notion of God that sometimes we have, that we were, that was inculcated into us, that we kind of don't really believe that. We want to believe that that's true. Uh, my friend Annie Lamott says, um, you know you've created God in your own image when God hates the same people you do. <laughs> and so how do we find this other notion, this other God? I had a spiritual director many years ago who said to me, uh, you know, we need a better God than the one we have. He was a Jesuit. Um, but of course he's right. Uh, Ignatius always talked about the God who's always greater. Take care to keep always before your eyes first God. And that the secret of the ministry of Jesus was that God was at the center of it, but a, a particular kind of God. I remember years ago I was saying mass in a gym like this uh, at San Fernando Juvenile Hall, and there were like 500 gang members on folding chairs, and, and I was on, up on a little raised platform like this, and I was vested, you know, in an alb and a stole, and, um, and then there was a kind of little the podium over here, and, and they had these sheets that had the readings in English and in Spanish, and, and you know what you do when some of you here are presiders, and so you close your eyes, and, and I rested the sheet on my lap, and I thought, well, I'm just going to listen to the word proclaimed. And Homie got up and did the first reading. And, and, but the responsorial psalm, the guy got up, and there was an overabundance of confidence in his voice. And he gets up and he says, the Lord is exhausted. <laughs> and I look at the sheet, what the hell? And it was, the Lord is exalted. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, that's way better. <laughs> because you all can connect to the exhausted God. You know, if, if you have kids or if you're grandparents, you know, somebody says, how was your weekend? I'm exhausted. We had the grandkids for the weekend, you know. And, but it was a good tired. You know, you might say that. And, and you know what a good tired is. It's, it was extensive. It was out of yourself. It was discovering your true self and loving. You were exhausted. I like the exhausted God better. Uh, my friend Mirabai Starr, who's a, a mystic and writes on mystics and translates John of the Cross and people like that, 
she says, once you know the God of love, you fire all the other gods. And I think that's the task, the human task, but it's the adult maturation task is to fire all the other gods. One of the things that um, maybe you have had this experience as well during the pandemic, you know, obviously Zooms, I didn't know what a Zoom was before COVID, but, but my siblings, there are eight of us in, in plus all their spouses, once a month at four o'clock on a Sunday, we have a Zoom. So we just uh, had one and it was uh, my mom's, uh, the, the, like uh, the fourth anniversary of her death. And uh, I had buried my father like 25 years ago, but my, my mom died at 92 and she was, uh, uh, you know, died the way you would want to die, you know, uh, in your own bed, in your own home, surrounded by your kids. And she was sharp as a tack. I mean, really, in the last year of her life, she watched so much MSNBC, she was becoming Rachel Maddow. <laughs> and she wasn't a lick afraid of dying, you know. Uh, in fact, about a month before she died, she was just positively giddy. And she said, I've never done this before. <laughs> you know, which is something you might say just before diving out of a plane, you know, skydiving. In fact, the day before she died, it was uh, like uh, I was sitting alone in her room by her bed, and uh, which never happened because it was have so many siblings who are always there and grandchildren. But I was alone with her and she was asleep and she woke up and she saw me and she said, Oh, for crying out loud. And she went back to sleep. Well, she was pissed that she hadn't died, you know, so. <laughs> sorry. But then the next day, uh, as luck would have it again, it was exactly at noon. A couple of my sisters went out uh, to buy uh, some lunch. And I was there alone at the foot of her bed. And at exactly noon, she lifts her head. She opens her eyes. She lets out this wondrous, glorious gasp. <gasps> Skydiving. And then uh, she left us. And no one in earshot of that sound could ever be afraid of death again. But in, in the last uh, couple months before she died, she, you know, she'd be kind of in and out of consciousness and we'd be surrounding her and the two of us or four of us or all eight of us, and, and uh, when she would come to, she would lock on to one of us, and, and it was this laser beam focus, and she would say with breathless delight, oh, you're here, you're here. And when I buried her, I remembered that that was her refrain. And I thought, that may well be the singular agenda item of the God we actually have. The God of love looks at you with breathless delight and says, you're here, you're here. And so we receive the tender glance and then we choose to be the tender glance in the world. So, you know, we're about at the second Sunday of Lent, and we started Lent uh, recently, and uh, uh, it always reminds me of a homegirl named Michelle, who was a tough cookie, who came into my office one day, and she said, well, it's official. I said, what? I just found out my man's been cheating on me. Oh, I don't sweat it. I mean, I, I went to church got me them ashes, gave his ass up for Lent. <laughs> that doesn't have anything to do with anything, but it's, it's, it's my favorite Lenten story. <laughs> but, you know, so we think about Jesus in the 40 days in the desert and and we have this image of, uh, you know, 
grumbling stomach and uh, fasting and dark night of the soul and maybe uh, doubts and, you know, Jesus thinking, should I have given up both chocolate and scotch for, <laughs> for Lent or whatever it was, you know, and yet I'm so almost certain the whole thing was about God looking at Jesus and saying, you're here, you're here. And Jesus not really exactly knowing what to say back except, you're here. And that's about it. And we're called to be in the world who God is, compassionate, loving, and kind. We receive the tender glance and then we ch decide to be that tender glance in the world. And that's the hope. I was reading the other day, uh, somebody had sent me something, uh, article, um, and it introduced to me a word I'd never heard before uh, from the uh, Spiritual Journal of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And on uh, February 17th, 1544, Ignatius wrote this word in Spanish. And I speak Spanish. I'd never heard of this word before. I'm 50 years a Jesuit, along with Kevin Ballard here. We entered together, and um, I had never heard this word before. And the word was acatamiento. I'd never heard of it. And Ignatius uh, proceeded to use that for, uh, in his journal until, you know, 12 years later, and he died. But he would go back and he'd circle the word acatamiento, and it comes from the word that means to look at something with attention. And it gets translated in English as affectionate awe. And it is how God sees us. And it is how we are meant to see each other. At Homeboy, we're kind of allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking folks to measure up. And that's mainly because our exhausted God never does that to us. Why would we do this to each other? Instead, we hold the mirror up and we try to tell people the truth, that they are exactly what God had in mind when God made them. And then you watch folks become that truth and inhabit that truth and no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out and death can't touch it because it's huge. But you have to reach in and you have to dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way that keep people from seeing their truth. In the Acts of the Apostles, it has this very odd line, and it says simply, and awe came upon everyone. And it suggests that the measure of health in any community at all, including this one, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe, affectionate awe, at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. For almost, uh, well, for 38 years, I guess, I, you know, I've been in every detention facility in Los Angeles County. We have a lot of them. They're starting to close down, which is a good thing, but we've really three juvenile halls and jails and the largest mental uh, health uh, institution uh, on the planet is LA County Jail. And all these probation camps where, you know, I uh, met a lot of the homies. And, uh, and so my Saturdays always look the same, you know, so I, I'll say a couple masses way out in the boonies uh, early morning on a Saturday. And they race back to, uh, to Dolores Mission where I've, I've lived for a, really a lot of years and, uh, and where I was pastor for six years. And so I know a lot of people and the homies asked me to do stuff. And so, 
my Saturdays always look the same, you know, a one o'clock baptism and a two o'clock quinceanera and a, a three o'clock wedding and a four o'clock exorcism. And <laughs> just checking to see if you're still listening. I, um, I've never done one of those, but I, so I came back and it was like 12, uh, you know, 35, and I thought, well, I have time to go to my office on those days it was on First Street. Um, as Jose called it the other day, a hole in the wall, so thank you very much for that. And so I go to our hole in the wall to see if I can go through the mail before my one o'clock baptism. And, and, uh, and I'm not there very long when uh, this woman comes in and uh, I find out her name is Lisa, and she's like in her mid-30s. And she's never stepped foot in the office before, and uh, she's a gang member, heavily tattooed, a felon, a prostitute, a heroin addict. The homies uh, called her La Gritona. She was uh, always screaming. You could hear her like clockwork screaming at the uh, the bartender next door who would toss her out daily and she'd shake her fist at him. And you could hear her across the street at the payphone and, and she would always be hollering into the payphone, just let me stay tonight, pleading with family members or friends. And this is the first time she's ever stepped foot in my office and now it's 10 minutes to one in my baptism. And she comes into my office and she kind of surveys the place and looks at all the photographs and, and she plunks herself down and she launches right in. She says, I need help. Oh, I've been to like 50 rehabs. I'm known all over, nationwide. And then she kind of takes this detour. I went to Catholic schools all my life. I graduated from elementary. I even graduated from Sacred Heart High School in Lincoln Heights. And then she gets still. In fact, first time I ever used heroin was right after I graduated. And I've been trying to stop since the moment I began. And I watch as her head leans on the wall behind her and her eyes become two ponds, water rising to meet its edges and spilling over. And she cried and she cried and I let her cry until finally she leveled her gaze at me and she said with great deliberation, I am a disgrace. And suddenly her shame met mine because when I had seen her step into my office that afternoon, I had mistaken her for an interruption. We're invited to make friends with our own wounds. Otherwise, we're tempted to despise the wounded. In the original covenantal language, it says, as I have loved you, so must you have a preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and the stranger. And God has uh, identified these three subgroupings of the poor because God thinks these are the people who know what it's like to have been cut off. And because they have suffered in exactly this way, God thinks these happen to be our trustworthy guides to lead the rest of us to the kinship of God. 
You don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks there will make you different. You go to the margins so that the widow and the orphan and stranger will alter our hearts and will reach us. They say that in the original language and understanding of widow, orphan, and stranger, these were the folks who society said, we can live without you. We go to the margins to stand with folks and announce to them, we refuse to live without you. The homies uh, will often say at Homeboy Industries, especially so many of them have had long stretches in prison, we're used to being watched, but we're not used to being seen. You want to see people. A homie said to me the other day, once you see me, I'll always remember what I look like. The Buddhists say, oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. And so part of what we do, all of us together, is we try to make people feel less invisible by seeing them. The Christmas Carol says, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. And yeah, it's a song about Jesus and it's a song about Christmas, but how is it not the job description of every one of us here? You appear and the soul feels its worth. Exactly right. When I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village, we had eight gangs at war with each other, which led the Los Angeles Police Department to deem my parish as the place of the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere. So I buried my first young person killed because of this sadness in 1988. And three weeks ago, I buried my 254th, a young man named Jeremy, who was 14 years old. Not all of them are from, were from my parish, but I run a, a large gang intervention program, so I, I know a lot of gang members. I get asked to do this. In the old days, I would ride my bike, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, and uh, way late, you know, past midnight, which is hard to imagine now because I'm a geezer and I go to bed early. But, but in those days, I would patrol the eight uh, kind of gang territories to kind of, you know, put that Uzi down. Are you sure you want to shoot that guy kind of thing? And, and I remember going over to Aliso Village and I was talking to these eight guys from this one gang and it was in this darkened archway and uh, I could see over in the, the parking lot, which was poorly lit, but I could see this kid that we all called Bandit. And he was uh, running up to a car and he was selling crack cocaine, which is what they did in those days. And, and then he's counting the money and he's walking towards these uh, gang members, his homies, and he didn't know that I had arrived while he was making that sale. I wish I could say he was embarrassed, but he wasn't. And he always refused to come to Homeboy Industries for help until he did. And, you know, it, like in recovery, uh, they say it takes what it takes. Gang recovery is the same thing. It can be the birth of a friend, the, the, the birth of a, a son, the death of a friend, a long stretch in prison, it takes what it takes. And so one day 
uh, bandit walked in at Homeboy Industries. I couldn't believe it. And, and he says, I'm tired of being tired. And so he began his 18-month uh, training program like Jose and Raquan. And uh, he started to come to terms with what was done to him. And, he did therapy and he removed his tattoos in our clinic, which was on the property, and he decided to transform his pain so he didn't have to transmit it anymore. And he got his GED and uh, he went to all these classes that we have, like anger management and parenting. And Homeboy was like a sanctuary for him, and then he became the sanctuary that he sought. And then he would go home to his wife and kids and he would present that sanctuary to them and, and suddenly he broke the cycle. His life was exceedingly hard. He was tortured and abused and we know that no hopeful kid has ever joined a gang in the history of the world. He was no different. If his story had been a flame, you'd have to keep your distance, otherwise you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a single day of his childhood. And then, you know, the time comes when your 18 months are over and we have a job developer, several who find the next job so that the transition is seamless and 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 then you know the world will throw at you what it will but this time you won't be toppled because you are an anthem of resilience and so we found uh, they found him a job a entry level job a low paying job first kind of job in a warehouse and he married his childhood sweetheart from the projects. He had three daughters. Um, he worked at the warehouse like five years in. He became the, you know, the whatever, the floor manager. And then several years after that, he was even more highly uh, elevated and promoted and bought his own house. Well, I hadn't heard from him in a long time, and uh, no news is good news with gang members usually. And, and so he calls me uh, on a Friday afternoon late, and there's kind of panic in his voice. And he says, gee, you got to bless my daughter. I said, que paso, mico? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? Oh, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. Imagine my Jessica. She's going to college, but she's a little chaparita, and, and we're afraid for her. And Humboldt's far. It's way up north. Do you think you could give her a blessing before she goes? And, and I said, sure. My gosh, I'd be happy to do that. And look, tomorrow's Saturday. I have an exorcism at 1. <laughs> uh, why don't you come at, at 1230, and we'll do a little send-off. And uh, so sure enough, a bandit and his wife and the three kids are, are at the church, and uh, including tiny little uh, Jessica. So we, we, I put her in front of the altar and we encircle her with our bodies. I said, come on, everybody touch her and put your hands on her head. And, and I, I tell them to bow their heads and to close their eyes. And as the homies say, I, I do a long ass prayer. You know, I go on and on. And, and somewhere in the middle of this prayer, I notice that we've all become chiones, you know, we're all crying, we're all sloppy crying. <laughs> and I don't know why we're blubbering so much, except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me. Certainly nobody in their families. And so, you know, we wipe our eyes and we laugh about how mushy we got. And to change the subject, I, I look at Jessica, hey, what are you going to study at Humboldt College? And she was very quick, forensic psychology. And I go, damn, forensic psychology. And, <laughs> and Bannon over here chimes in, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. 
And Jessica, very deadpan, looks at her father, and then she does one of these, you know, and, and he sees her and he laughs. He says, yep, I'm going to be her first subject. <laughs> so we go out to the car in big abrazos, and they all pile into the car, but Bandit hangs back. I'm glad he has. And I said, hey, can I tell you something? I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become, for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes well up with tears, and it takes him a while to speak. Sabi's key, he says, I'm proud of myself. All my life, People called me a low life, a bueno para nada, a good for nothing. I guess I showed them. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. Oh, nobly born, remember who you really are. We receive the tender glance, and we choose to be the tender glance in the world because we can do no other. And we don't watch, we see, and we all inhabit our mutual dignity and nobility when we do it. And somehow, we're receiving this tender glance, and it fills us with acatamiento, affectionate awe. And we can do no other but to see as our exhausted God sees. And so we go to the margins, and they get erased, and the circle widens, and we love being loving. And before we know it, we cease to care if anyone accuses us of wasting our time there. For in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. Thank you very much. So this is what we're going to do. Um, go ahead, sit down. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and this really works fine, uh, where you just go like this and I go like that. And then I will, uh, one of the three of us will field that question. I'll repeat the question as I pass it to one of them or however this works. And we won't keep you too long. Yeah. Hi. I'm wondering about you received a, a large a large grant recently. I I understand from um, from Deputy's ex-wife. Yes. Yes. The question is about. What are some things you're going to think? What are some plans that the industry has in mind to to do with that money? Yes. So uh, the money it was uh, a, a good chunk of change and. Uh, a homie came to me and he goes, hey, I heard, I heard you got some feria, some money, from uh, Bozo's wife. <laughs> and I said, well, it was actually Bezo's wife, X, because 
because uh, I don't believe Bozo has that kind of money. So, uh, so you know, we're always kind of, we're not, we're not sure we even have that much of a plan anywhere. Uh, you know, normally we're just responding to things. So everything we've added from, we have 10 social enterprises now, uh, 10,000 gang members a year walk through our doors. Um, and so we're responding to things, you know, um, uh, both Raquan and Jose mentioned, uh, you know, essentially homelessness. And so that's, that's become a big issue. Like 70% of all our folks are, according to the federal guidelines, homeless. So, um, you know, surf couching, uh, couch surfing, excuse me, and uh, living in the cars or whatever, overstaying their welcome somewhere. So uh, we want to build, we have plans kind of on contiguous property uh, to build transitional housing and permanent housing. So just we're trying to, um, they've just decided not to, to rebuild the men's central jail. So they're going to tear it down and not rebuild it. So, and that's after a lot of pressure from a lot of people. And, and it's kind of remarkable that the Board of Supervisors said, okay, we're not going to build it. So we want to fill that vacuum with what we call Hope Village. And so, uh, you know, we want to imagine what would it look like to have really humane uh, delivery of mental health services that's culturally appropriate and timely, and uh, housing and substance abuse, all this kind of stuff. So we could kind of say, let's imagine a world without prisons and, and let's sort of uh, build it. So um, that's the idea. It was $20 million, but we're a $40 million annual operation. So um, it was a lot of money and very helpful, but it's always a heavy lift, you know. Uh, oddly, during the pandemic, people were remarkably generous. And, you know, we were all kind of bracing ourselves as people were, you know, hoarding toilet paper, you know, at, at, remember in the early days. But then you thought, this will not bode well for nonprofits. Well, I don't know what your experience is up here, but uh, people were extraordinarily generous during that time. So, good. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is about how, how do ga gangs, uh, I guess, see Homeboy Industries or me, or uh, do they have, you know, a, a grudging respect? So, I don't know. Um, of course we do. He's well, he's well respected everywhere he goes. Everybody loves him like a dad. Everybody loves him like... I'm not the only one that comes in a, in a broken home family. I'm not the only one who comes with a background like I do. A lot of us do. You know, only like, like he said before, only that people don't see us like that. You know, see, people only see us from the outside, not from the inside. And Father Greg, which is Pops, he never did that. You know, he will always see us for the humans that we are, and he's always going to be loved and respected for that. Yeah, I also think there are a lot of mythic notions out there, you know, that uh, somehow gangs will see me as an opponent because, you know, you leave your neighborhood or your clique or your gang, and then you step away and you, you know, try to imagine a life for yourself. So um, anyway, I, I just think it's, uh, uh, th that's that myth out there. Um, our first 10 years uh, of existence was uh, marked by death threats, bomb threats, and hate mail, and never from gang members, ever because we were always a symbol of hope to gang members. But law enforcement, mainly, almost all the anonymous uh, hate mail <laughs> was, I'm a sheriff and I hate you. I mean, really stuff like that. I, I'm an I'm a LAPD and, and I think you're part of the problem. Yeah, like co-signing, uh, you know, so it was like the friend of our enemy is our enemy and, uh, and I, we were kind of seen as by law enforcement as fraternizers with the enemy, and it's the price you pay when you demonize in a way that's kind of wholesale. And then, but I'll have to admit, it's hard to retrieve now that 
that those 10 years of hostility because, uh, you know, homeboy is kind of, uh, don't you think, kind of people, I mean, it, the society kind of uh, understands that it's uh, smart on crime and they would had enough of tough on crime. Though I fear that we may be returning to uh, dumb on crime, but uh, I hope not. There was some, yes, ma'am. It's okay, we got it. I work for the outside group, uh, for the and I'm looking for guys that we need a little more data. He's been in prison since the beginning. He's now almost 50. In and out of all of the prisons in California, and he asked me to ask you to pray for him. He met you in 2000. Mm -hmm. prison on Easter and you said mass and ate dinner with him. There was 20 Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. And he says I will never forget that because how warm you were and accepting to him. He yeah. Says, I'll remember that all my life. Yeah, thank you. So it, she, she works in the archdiocese in with prisons and met a, a, a inmate named Albert uh, Sanchez. Ah! Okay, that's what I was trying to repeat. I'm trying to repeat for her. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so she talks that she works in prison, and, uh, uh, and she met a young man named Albert Sanchez who knew me and met me in Corcoran Prison. Alberto, yeah. And uh, so I did mass there, I guess, on Easter Sunday, and we had a little meal after, which I remember. Yeah, although I don't remember him, but but I remember that time. Well, you gave him your card, and I said, did you use it? He said, no. Yeah, I, I gave him my card, and he he didn't use it, I guess. So <laughs> I found out thousands of my cards, you know, and, uh, and I, you know, probably once a week, I'll have some guy come in heavily tattooed who, um, uh, you know, who, will say what they always say, which is, do you remember me? And I'll say, uh, gosh, no, I don't think. He says, well, I'm, you know, I made my first communion with you at Central Juvenile Hall, and, and you gave me your card. And then he reaches into his wallet, and he pulls out this tired old yellowed card with, you know, three addresses ago, you know. And, uh, and I say, wow, this is such an old card. And I go to hand it back, and they always say the same thing with big tears in their eyes. They'll say, I should have called you. And it's heartbreaking, you know. I always tell that story to homies at Juvenile Hall. I always say, don't be that guy. <laughs> Call me. I guarantee you we'll hire you right away. Yes, ma'am. That's great. If, if we could have your moms here, what, what would your mom say about uh, <laughs> what makes them most proud of you? Um, just the transformation of my life, you know? I was, I was very defiant as a young age, you know? I would always go, like she always wanted the best for me, I, I guess you could say. She was always pushing, pushing, pushing for me to do good, very strict. I would say she was like the police at times. She would raid my room, so I would come home from school, everything tossed around, that kind of, you know, <laughs> stern. <laughs> and um, so to see me transform into an IT specialist at Homeboy Industries, to um, be a father to two da beautiful daughters, and to just be stable, she was, she, she's really proud. Talk about the man. As far as for me, I think she she be I'm um, didn't turn out to be like my dad, you know. I became a man that he never taught me to be, and uh, and a, a great father to my kids that he never taught me to be, you know. And not only that, I made it something about myself. I'm not a nobody. I am a somebody today, you know. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yes, way back there. Yeah, about replicating the program. So, you know, uh, I always get that question. And, and you know, when we moved into our current uh, uh, headquarters in 2008, that's when we started to get a lot of delegations from all over the world and the country. And so uh, people would, I can remember in particular Wichita, a delegation of stakeholders, you know, like city council and, uh, um, you know, mayor and chief of police, that kind of group. And they came in, they said, please uh, replicate this in Wichita, you know, airlift homeboy into Wichita. And, and so I remember, uh, I didn't, didn't know what to say, so I gathered my staff together. I said, you know, we're starting to get this question, you know, and do we want to become the, you know, the McDonald's of <laughs> gang intervention programs with, <laughs> over five billion gang members served, you know, and, <laughs> and we kind of decided not to do that. So we said, well, what if we offered uh, technical assistance? So that's what we did. And so what was born in the wake of that was a thing we call the Global Homeboy Network. And so there are 300 programs in the United States and 50 outside the country that are modeled on Homeboy, and uh, we're always giving tours and, and technical assistance that usually lasts about five days. And, and then we gather for three days every August. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's really a kind of a magical thing uh, called the gathering. Did you, have you ever been to one of those? No? Yeah, pandemic uh, killed us for two years, but we did it virtual, which wasn't the same. But and so you have Rise Up Industries in San Diego, and you have Braveheart Industries in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, and, and not all the things translate, you know, so uh, tattoo removal doesn't make any sense in Scotland, but it makes a lot of sense in Guatemala City. So that kind of thing. And, uh, and then lately what we found just before the pandemic, we were getting delegations of folks in, you know, you would presume things like uh, a delegation from Detroit, and you presume it would be, you know, with disaffected youth or gang members or maybe even returning citizens, but it was actually for homeless folks. So it was like a methodology, uh, an approach. So if it's true that traumatized people are, are going to be inclined to cause trauma, then it's equally true that cherished people will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others. So we often talk about systems changing, and systems change when people change, and people change when they feel cherished. And so that's kind of the, the methodology. So if love is the answer, community is the context, but tenderness is is the methodology, it's, it's the connective tissue. Otherwise, love stays in the air or in your head or, or even in your heart, but unless it becomes tender, it doesn't connect. And, uh, and so then, so people apply that to every vexing social dilemma from mental health concerns and, uh, and the like. Yes, way up there, maybe one more question. Yeah. Uh, a great follow up from what you were just saying. I think when you're working with a population that suffers trauma, trust is hard to come by when you're trying to minister. And I'm curious if uh, the gentleman was talking about as they were coming in, like, what was the magic sauce? Like, how were they, how were they able to walk in and open up and maybe you as a kind of what you're you know, trust. ministering? What, what guides that a little bit? Kind of concretely, what are you doing? What are the, what are the icebreakers? How are you getting them? Yeah, the question is about trust. How do people trust when they come in and uh, have that experience that's palpable of trust? Basically, we just tired of being tired, you know, and when there's somebody like Father G, as I, call, I like to call him Pops, when there's somebody like Pops that give us unconditional love and see us for who we are, trust comes easily, you know? We are home, we are home, we are home. We start our sanctuary, our home with industry. We are home, so the trust comes easy for us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I guess to, to better explain that uh, with the trust thing, 
with with living that lifestyle that we lived and and also doing time you learn how to read people body language you can pretty much tell a person's intentions just within a few minutes of knowing them you know and um so when you meet pops you can you can off top you can feel that warmth like people say that love you can tell he has no ill intentions towards us so it's more easier to just say okay this is a this is a good place like i'm in a good spot i can be comfortable with this individual because you you feel that you can you you feed off of energy you know so that energy when you come in it's like it's pure it's it's loving it's caring it's compassion it's kinship so that's how we learn to trust this man because it's 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 in him it's not just something he puts out there you can feel it you know thank you but you know when they 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 talk about any kind of again vexing social dilemma from mental health to uh, the unhoused or returning citizens or whatever that they, they, the starting point always is a safe place so if you can create that safe place but at homeboy we we kind of go a little step further we 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 always want to imagine homeboy industries as the front porch of the house everyone wants to live in. And so you have to create, the culture is the most important thing. And we're not trying to create a behaving community, but a community of beloved belonging. Uh, the poet Wallace Stevens says, uh, we live in the description of the place and not the place itself. And so as a society, we s settle for the description of the place. But we really do have to hold out for the place itself. And that's kind of key. So I, you know, I go all over the country, and, and, I, and I meet programs that are comparable to Homeboy. And we all do the same, we all have the same menu of services that we deliver. You know, you name it, we all do it. You know, um, anger management therapy, case management, navigators, tattoo removal, substance abuse, uh, parenting classes, GED. Everybody does really the same menu of services. But I think at Homeboy, all those things are secondary to, to the culture, which creates the safe place where people can uh, breathe easier and then they can breathe differently. And, uh, and I'll maybe just end with this. The other day I had a, a, a gang member come in uh, 20, after 23 years in prison. And uh, he, uh, his name was Trayvon. And I never met him before and he was exceedingly nervous, you know. And he was sitting there and so we have a process of our 18 month program. You drug test on Friday and you get a little note says you've been approved to begin the process. And it's, uh, all the men are gang members, and, and the women uh, uh, are all felons, because the women um, represent, you know, 97% of all gang members are male. And so like 3% are female. So if we said you have to be a gang member, we wouldn't have any women working there, basically. So we, we changed who we were at some point to say, in, to include women, we, we said felons. So uh, you drug test, and then a week later, you, if you're clean, you come the week later to, uh, for orientation to see, is this what you want? Here's who we are. And then you go uh, the, to uh, the um, selection committee, which is an interview with peers, homies. And then uh, your name goes to the council, and then they uh, decide yay or nay, you know. And we're kind of reverse cher cherry pickers. We don't pick, we pick people who are, you know, belligerent and uh, hard-headed and, um, you know, and who need homeboy, you know. Uh, sorry, anyway. Um, <laughs> knuckleheads, in other words. So, so Trayvon is sitting there, he's, he's very nervous, he's almost hyperventilating, he's saying uh, that he'd just finished 23 years in prison. 
And so I'm writing the note that says, and these guys got that note, you know, that says drug test any Friday at 10. And I'm going to give it to him, and, and he has to bring it back on a Friday. And so, you know, I'm writing it, and I'm asking him, making small talk, you know. I said, well, how'd you hear about Homeboy? And he goes, well, some female told me about it. Oh. Yeah, you fathered all her children. <laughs> I stopped writing. <laughs> Say what now? And he kind of looked at it floating in the air and he went, no, that's not right. <laughs> you baptized all her children. <laughs> oh my God, we literally collapsed <laughs> laughing. And uh, I said, give me that sheet back. And I ripped it up. I said, you start tomorrow. <laughs> And, and as we say at, at Homeboy, we laugh from the stomach. Uh, and that can only happen if, if there's a kind of an essential culture that fosters uh, trust. And it can only happen if we don't settle for the description of the place, uh, but hold out for the place itself. Thank you all very much.